Well, yeah, I live in Virginia in the DC area. Um, been here for 30 years. Um, so kind of core mid Atlantic skiing. Uh, I grew up on Long Island. Um, so I hit a lot of the kind of metro accessible uh, ski areas um, and first went skiing with a Boy Scout group. Came out with a group, <laughs> some tiny little resort, Holiday Mountain, I think it was, or something like that, had a rope tow, <laughs> um, and just loved it from day one, uh, and just have always loved skiing. Um, so being here in the mid-Atlantic, I do a lot of day trips, um, you know, kind of get up early, get up to the mountain, kind of about when they open get in as many runs as I can and get myself home. My number one place is called is Whitetail. Uh, Whitetail is closer by a little bit and has a smidge better terrain. Um, but did they're you, all about the same distance. Did you grow up in a family that skied? No, I was the only person who skied. So my mom was good. Took me on a couple of ski trips when I was young because um, she could tell that I just loved it. Um, and I've got a sister that lived in Colorado for, or has lived in Colorado for years. So I definitely use that connection to to get myself out there and have some days on the mountain in Colorado. So when you usually go skiing, um, who do you ski with? You know, it's a mix. I will often meet up with friends at a resort. You know, I'll plan. I've got a couple of high school friends, college friends, where we'll meet up at a resort. Um, and I've also got a group of work colleagues who like to ski and we've now done a couple of times where we've done essentially meetups um, where we all know we're going to be at a particular resort. We'll ski together some of the time, ski apart some of the time. Uh, it's just a good chance to connect and also ski alone a bit. Like I think I'm a little bit unusual that way where I don't mind just going on my own and figuring it out. Yeah. I mean, when, when my wife and I are planning a trip, you know, and thinking about, hey, where do we want a vacation? What do we want to do? The absolute alternative could be, okay, are we doing a, a, a you know, a long weekend or a week of skiing somewhere? Or are we going someplace warm? Um, and figuring out that some people are like me and they want to be there when the rope drops. And some people want to have a convenient spa experience so that they can ski from 10 to 2 and kick their feet up and have other activities and be thinking more holistically that there's more than one type of skier and you got to make it fun for everybody. And a, a large part of that is because you enjoy the skiing so much and yeah. the passion behind it, but you have uh, dragged your, your wife into skiing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When we met, she had skied a handful of times, um, but not regularly, but we uh, she's been game to, get into it more. Um, we did go and get her decent boots, got a properly fitted in her own skis uh, and kind of proper equipment because uh, that has so much to do with sort of comfort on the mountain and comfort in terms of weather. Um, and that was definitely a game changer. So it's been fun to have um, time with her on the mountains and time with sort of family as a group and meeting up that way. So how often do you tend to go skiing over a winter? Given where I live, much of it's dictated by weather. Um, we've had years when whitetail can't open until second week in January. And you end up with, you know, six, eight weeks of ski season. And then in those cases, maybe I can get up two, three times um, for a, for a day trip. So it's enough to get time on skis, which is better than not, you know, it's fun and it, you know, kind of gets you back in the swing of things, but I've got to plan some trips out West to have any kind of real skiing. You know, in general, I would love to be able to get sort of 10 to 15 days on the mountain total. Um, I don't get there most years, but some years I do. Do you, um, do you purchase a season pass? Yeah, so our local resorts were bought by Vail a few years ago, um, and my sister lived in Breckenridge when she was living up in the mountains in Colorado. So as soon as the Epic Pass came out, I was an early buyer of it. So I've had it now for yeah more than ten years, probably closer to fifteen years. It makes sense, and I 
the economics of it are less clear. It used to be a no brainer um, between being able to go up there and the local mountain, but between the limited days here and then the ridiculous lines that you see at some of the Vale resorts, it has certainly made me second guess the the economics of it. Do you, did you buy it again for this winter? I did grudgingly. <laughs> uh, my my protest vote was that I turned off the auto renew and I just waited until like the last minute. I'm sure if I'll get my money's worth. Um, so I, I've also thought about switching to one of the other uh, passes for my out west trips because so many of the I at least have a perception at this point that non Vale resorts aren't going to have the horrific lift lines uh, that you see, you know, when you see uh, the line for the, for the gondola and Brack winding all the way through town, like that's not interesting. There's obviously a piece of it where if you buy a pass and there's sort of the sunk cost that then you're more likely to plan a trip and tell yourself, Oh, I've already paid for the pass. You know, I might as well go, go out West and, and do some trips. So the economics definitely factor in and also just looking at the number of days it takes to sort of get a payback on the pass. But like I said, it's less clear than it used to be. You know, the pass used to be half the price that it is now. Uh, and you've got a few more days in. Oh, you get a pass, but what about your wife? Um, would you get one for her? We don't. Uh, we do buddy passes. So whether it's uh, whether my wife or, you know, kind of friends and family, we do buddy passes whenever we can. And that saves us some money. Things they could control. I'll, I'll use a positive example for a minute. I have liked that the ownership and management of, of Whitetail right now has been sort of better about prioritizing snowmaking on certain trails. They don't try to open the whole mountain anymore. They prioritize certain trails and try to lay down enough snow that if we have a warm spell, they can survive through it. They've got to be thoughtful like that. And frankly, they've got a signal that they are trying their absolute best to get open. Um, we know they are, but you have times when you realize, okay, they've stopped trying to stay open. They're sort of given up. They don't want to blow snow anymore. Um, and then I, I think out West, they've got to figure out how to, not have these crazy lines with the resorts that have passes. Uh, when I went out for a group trip last year, we avoided uh, epic um, resorts, principally because of that. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to go to them. There's a real negative perception. And I, I don't think Vail has done a spectacular job managing public perception and their communications. It just hasn't been the best. You've had uh, you know a pass for for a long time. You know you visit the same resorts. Do you feel like they really know who you are, or do you feel like you're just kind of another number? Definitely a number. Um, yeah, I, I, it makes me laugh that I, I'll get notifications from certain resorts within the umbrella just because I've been there, but they don't seem to look at the pattern. You know, when you get an email that says, you know. Hey, we want to celebrate your days on the mountain. And it says zero. Is that really an email that you needed to say? Like, you know, you got to think about those communications. You know, if you're sending someone a message that says, congratulations on your two days on the mountain, probably just better off saying, hey, how do we help you have a better experience? It feels like when in the realm of passes and how they're the economics and how they're created, it feels like there has to be a better way to not end up with the, they call it the tragedy of the commons, you know, kind of once everybody's bought the pass, it's essentially free. So people overuse it and you get this crowding. There's gotta be some middle ground where maybe the pass, you know, you buy a pass, but then you pay a, a certain amount for usage at each resort just to keep people from going crazy. Like there's just gotta be more creativity in the economics of these passes to make it worthwhile. Um, because it's frustrating. You definitely feel like you're held hostage. It's one of the other things too, I think when you look at the other pieces of the experience, uh, my wife and I took our niece skiing last year and I think we were in the rental line for, for over an hour. And, you know, we'd made reservations. Can, you know, what can you do to make that experience better? Can you get boot sizes and ski sizes and other things you can do to speed the process up? 
felt like the same process that's always existed in it and it was just really slow And with all these hurdles, you're still going skiing. <laughs> oh yeah i love it um you know I'll, I'll do it as long as i can uh as often as i can um but it'd be nice to sort of have it be a little more frictionless